First, let me say thank you to the club for allowing me to do a presentation <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about esophageal cancer patients and the various services that we can provide to them. It was interesting to be between two talks of talking about new surgeons and talking about retired surgeons. And really the common denominator in both is the patient. First, let me, let me say I don't have anything to disclose. <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about me personally. Graduated from St. John's University with a degree in business administration. Two things of significance happened at St. John's. One, I had an athletic scholarship at St. John's for baseball. And the second is I met my wife, Ginny, in freshman year. We were engaged in our senior year and got married in October after graduation. That was 52 years ago. We have two daughters and they've given us seven grandchildren, the oldest of which got married a little over a year ago. And this past holiday season, he came to us and said that he was thinking about raising a family. When I got home that night, I said to Jenny, hmm, I wonder what it's gonna be like sleeping with a great grandmother. She looked at me and said, headaches turn into migraines. On the business side, let's fast forward to, one, to January 1st, 1999. I, had, I was vice chairman and CEO of Chiltington International. They're an insurance and reinsurance consulting firm. I headed up their US operation. I had planned to retire at the end of 1999. <clears throat> and I planned all my life. So everything that I did had to have a reason, had to have a focus, had to have a goal. Dr. Robert Schuler, who some of you may know as a California evangelist on TV, used to have a saying, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And that became my motto. I kind of looked at everything that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. As the year unfolded, nothing was materializing. And that, the end of that year in, in December, we had our usual partners meeting in Hamburg, Germany. And one night out to dinner, had a piece of steak and it got stuck in my esophagus. Jumped up from the table because the pain was so intense. And as I stood up, the piece of meat must have cleared and the pain went away instantly. Everybody around the table looked at me as, are you okay, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, the rest of that week, nothing happened. So I was back to thinking nothing was wrong. Got back to the States, had lunch with a client, and lo and behold, had a hamburger and the same thing happened. I said, something's wrong. So I called my doctor and he said, let's go for an upper GI series. And we did that. And that afternoon he called me, asked me if I was sitting down. I said, no, why should I be sitting down? He said, because you have cancer. I said, cancer? Cancer of what? He said, the esophagus. I said, that's a food tube. How can you get cancer in a, in a food tube? He said, you do. I said, I don't smoke, I don't drink. I said, what caused this? And he asked me if I had heartburn. I said, I've had heartburn for 35 years. And every time I did, I took something over the counter and the heartburn went away. He said, heartburn caused your esophageal cancer. First thought that went through my mind at that point was how many people out there that had heartburn don't realize that potentially they could get esophageal cancer. And that thought stayed in my mind. So we proceeded to find out more about this disease. Asked several people, matter of fact, we went to a, a gastroenterologist to do an endoscope and uh, confirmed that we had a cancer. Uh, asked him, where should we go from here? And he said, find yourself a surgeon. When I asked him, did he have any recommendations? He said, no, which was a shock, but yet that's what happened. We had friends at Johnson & Johnson and Merrill Lynch, and I asked the executives that we were good friends with, if one of your executives had esophageal cancer, what institution and what surgeon would you recommend? Both of them came back with Sloan Kettering and Dr. Baines, so we went to see Dr. Baines. He took um, additional tests, did an EUS, 
did a PET scan and came back with a diagnosis of a five centimeter adenocarcinoma. And, and that was really the, the main thrust of, of hearing about the disease. Went through chemo, radiation, and surgery. Uh, Dr. Baines did my surgery. Nothing happened, no, no actual uh, side effects from the chemo and the radiation. The hair I have now was the hair I had before, was the hair I had after chemotherapy. Uh, surgery went well, uh, 10 days in the hospital. Dr. Baines um, came to me the next to last day and said we got back the biopsy of the tumor, and it was an early stage tumor, and he said that was the best biopsy you could ever, best result you could ever get. And that was really amazing, because at that point, went through a couple of months in the recovery process with a lot of the issues that we have focused on later on in the book I'll tell you about. And literally um, felt that we needed to give something back, that this disease, unknown to a lot of people, we just felt that we needed to do something to make people aware of this. So we created the Esophageal Cancer Education Foundation. It was formed in 2003 by my wife and I. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And basically, uh, right now, we have our financial statements audited uh, every year. And the last results was posted so far as the 2014 results. And 97% of any money that we receive in donations goes to research projects. The, the mission statement of the Esophageal Cancer Education Foundation is one, to bring awareness and educate the public about this disease. And we'll show a video at the end of this um, talk that'll bring that message home. Second is to walk the journey with patients who have this disease and we'll get more into that as well. Over the course of some 13 years, I've spoken to over 1,000 esophageal cancer patients that have had the journey through this disease. And the last mission statement is to focus on research projects that will lead to an early detection of this disease. We felt a cure would be beyond our lifetime, and if we can get somebody to just get a a test that would give us the ability to test this for this cancer, that would be the way we would want to go. The foundation has various patient services. One, and we'll talk about this in a little while, of patient-to-patient -patient programs. We have it on a pre-surgery and a post-surgery basis. Conference call support groups. Initially, we would meet face-to-face -face with people at the hospital but we found that as people got older in age, literally couldn't make that trek into a big city, so we decided to do it by conference call, and it's worked out very well. We'll talk about that in a little while as well. We have a 24-hour hotline, um, which is in my house, <laughs> and uh, it's amazing how uh, the, the, the different types of phone calls you get, and I will, we'll talk about that in a little while as well. And we have a book that we produce called The Esophageal Cancer Post-Surgical Guide, Questions and Answers. And again, we'll talk about that as we get on with this presentation. Let's talk a little bit more about the patient-to-patient -patient program. The definition of the patient-to-patient -patient program is patient who has been through a cancer comes back and walks the journey with patients who are hearing they have that cancer for the first time. If we had a goal for this disease, it would be to visit with or talk to patients who are preparing for surgery, okay? At Sloan Kettering is where we got all of this to begin with. Um, the program that they had initially was to see patients post-surgery, okay? And I guess I saw two patients in that mode and I said to Dr. Baines, I said, really the anxiety, the uncertainty, the, the fear existed pre-surgery and that that was where I thought we should try and see patients and he agreed with that and so we got to a point where he would see his patients on a Tuesday, new, new esophageal cancer patients on a Tuesday 
and the, he would have a team there which, which was made up of the medical oncologist and himself. And when they determined that the patient was a, a, a surgery candidate, Dr. Ilson at the time would go in and talk to that patient about the chemo and the radiation he would be putting that patient through. When he finished, then Dr. Baines would go in and talk to that patient about the surgery he would do and literally draw a diagram to show how the stomach and the esophagus and the part that he would remove. And after he finished his presentation, he would say to the patient and the, and the caregiver and the family that was there, you know, we have someone here today who's been through all of this. Would you like to talk to him? And he said occasionally they would say no because they weren't sure they would see. So he would kind of convince them to let me come in. So I would go into the room and you see caregivers and daughters and sons crying and the patient eyes down. And, and when they looked up and saw me, they say, wow, he doesn't look half bad. How could this really be? <laughs> so we, we, we pursued that and really from a a patient advocate point of view, be myself or anybody else that's involved in the program, it is a tremendous uplifting to that patient. So the first question I would ask that patient is, what, what, is, what was the reaction to what you just heard? And they would give us a whole list of things. They would say they were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed. They had a certain amount of fear, the anxiety. They were uncertain as to what lies ahead. How much pain will they go through? What will be like after surgery? What will be my quality of life? How long will I live? And I would say, well, if you have a question, let, let, me, let me pick one of these and I'll answer it for you. And I, I would pick the pain question because that seemed to be one that focused mostly in what they were saying. And I would say to them every morning, the nurse would come in and she'd take my vital signs and she'd ask me for my pain level, zero being no pain, 10 being excruciating pain. And depending on what I told her, she would adjust my pain medication to bring it down to the four to five level because what, he, what, what I was being asked to do is literally walk 14 laps around the 18th floor, which is a mile, at least that every day. Do 10 reps an hour of coughing, 10 reps an hour of <clears throat> and a, a breathing exercise. And I said, if I were in a whole lot of pain, I couldn't do any of those things. So that would put his mind sort of at ease that, hey, that's not bad. I think I can do that. Okay. So basically, the patient advocate's role is not to give his opinion. It's not to say anything other than what he has experienced himself. Okay, every question that's posed to me, translate that question into my experience, and that's what I tell the patient. I don't know how he's going to respond to that question. I don't know how he's going to react to it. So I can't tell him he'll be better off as a result of it. All I can say to him is that I went through this, and this is my result. We found that as a result of this, patients were more positive. They felt that they had a mind and spirit that was along for the ride initially, and now it was very much a part of what they wanted to do. They were confident. They had a sense of beating this disease, which is really when they first heard about it, they were nowhere near that kind of a thought process. They, they looked like they were taking on the challenge. Okay. And basically, all of this is really bringing a better prepared patient to the surgery. If his mind and spirit are positive, that brings a better patient to you guys to do the surgery on. The success of the program was such that not only was I seeing Dr. Baines's patients, but I was seeing Dr. Roosh's patients, Dr. Hawk's patients, Dr. Risk's patients, Dr. Jones's patients now. And basically, the question is, how could I be there every day of the week to see these patients? So we decided on this process. The nurse, well, let me, let me go through a bunch of them. The nurses 
would literally talk to the patients and they would, they would say to the nurse how much they took, they got benefit from what I was telling them. Same thing with the patients. They would, they would call us and they would call me because I give them my number and say they, and they would ask questions but then I would so awfully awful and also say that they were having a good good result of the conversations that they had with me. And the same thing with caregivers. How does it basically work? The doctor or the nurse will ask the patient would they like to talk to someone who has been through this disease. If the patient says no, well that's the end of the statement, there's nothing else to do. If the patient says yes, then I get an email from that nurse or that doctor with the patient's usually name, its telephone number, and any kind of information that they wish to tell me about them. That usually comes to us in a secured email. I'll call the patient, I'll talk to the patient, I'll then report back to whoever sent me the email telling them how that all went. So it keeps them abreast of what's going on. <clears throat> In that conversation, uh, we'll give them, as I said earlier, my telephone number, so he has the ability to contact me anytime he has a question. I also let them know that Jenny, my wife, who took care of me and is part of the caregiver program at, at Sloan, is available to talk to his wife or his spouse, depending on what, what, what it is. And basically, any questions that she may have as a result of me coming back from surgery, coming home, what do you do, that type of thing, she would be able to respond to that. The approach that I'm kind of giving you guys today is really from a post-surgery point of view. I wish this mic would be able to come off. Is that right? Good. Ah, thank you. What I'm recommending we do is that you select 20 of your most recent esophagectomy patients. We're gonna do a phone survey. We're gonna ask the patient if they wanna be part of a support group, okay? And we can give them all the benefits, and I'll mention it in a little while, as to what it is to be part of that group. We'd also ask them what day of the week would they be available. Give us two options, Monday through Friday. What, in it, in addition to that, what time during the day would they like to have a meeting in a conference call in the morning, the afternoon, or the evening? Okay. The benefits from that is that they're not alone in the recovery process. They're going to be listening to other patients in that conference call. Those patients are going to ex express issues. They may have had those same issues. So you get the benefit of hearing how other patients cope with those issues. It makes them feel they're not alone in the process, and that's a key element. What we're looking to do is to create a support group for your patients or your institution's patients, because those are the patients that will best know what they went through, and they become the, the key element in, in anybody that we can find on a new basis. We also invite both the professional staff to participate in the call. That's not to say to um, have a presentation available. That's not the case. All we want you to do is listen in and be available to answer any question that are medically driven. Okay, if it's a quality of life question, we can handle that. If it's a medical question, that's the part that we'd like for you guys to respond to. If there are nutritionists in your institution, they can be a part of this as well because a lot of the post-surgery issues deal with eating and nutritionists play a major role in that, obviously. Same thing with social workers. They can play a role in that conference call. What we would do is based on the group that we put together, we would select one member who could be the pre-surgery candidate for your institution or your, your surgical patients. We wanna be able to share his, their experience, their hospital stay, their recovery process. They, because they'll become a volunteer for your institution, you have to be aware of what the rules and regulations are in your volunteer department of your institution, very important part. Because they'll wanna go through some training of that patient, 
and more importantly, give them some hipper education because that could be a major role. What we have and what we have available, and it will be after the program, will be a card that we'll give you all a copy of. And it basically lays out the various things that we provide for patients post-surgery. Talks about the conference call support groups, patient and caregiver hotline, and the post-surgical guide, which is this book. Some of you have used it. Um, we make it available to the patients. Several institutions have bought a supply of these. And we ask if you, if you want to go that route to deal through us, because we do get a discount. And it's a 30% discount, so we just pass that on to you guys. The way the book got to be developed was, as I mentioned earlier, I've talked to over 1,000 esophageal cancer patients. So all of the issues that they have gone through, we try to capture those issues. And that, along with dealing with our medical staff, we developed the questions we would respond to. And then we asked each of our medical advisory committee members to take 10 questions and answer those questions. And that gave us what the book has consisted of. And as I said earlier, it's available to institutions if, if you guys would like to buy that. Or if you can give the card to patients who are post-surgery, they can choose to buy the book if they want to do that. The hotline is, again, as I said earlier, is a 24-hour available to everyone. We deal with just quality of life questions. We don't deal with medical questions. If a patient has a medical question, we refer them to their doctors. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that we've come across is patients that call from all over the United States. They're either looking for a second opinion or in some cases where the institution that they were dealing with doesn't take Medicare and they're now looking for some place to go. What we're hoping to do is to develop a contact list, possibly of all of you guys, where we can put it on a Google map 